Inheriting a mutation in BRCA1 or in BRCA2 genes causes high risks for breast and ovarian cancers. These cancers are often diagnosed before age 50, and they run in families. For years, everyone thought BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes had some property that made them specific for preventing breast and ovarian cancers. So, if you inherited a mutation in one of these genes, you were pretty much predestined to get breast and ovarian cancer. The idea that inheriting a gene mutation causes cancer meant that there was very little you could do if you were unlucky enough to have this inheritance. So preventing hereditary cancer has not been studied very much. But if you think about it, every cell in the body inherits the mutation. There are two copies of each BRCA gene, and usually only one is mutated. But this still puts a BRCA mutation within the chromosomes of every cell that has a nucleus. There was no real good explanation for why hereditary cancers seem to specifically target breast and ovary. These three papers show that it takes more than a BRCA mutation to direct hereditary cancer to a specific organ. An important clue came from considering risks due to infections that are known to cause cancer. These infections may only cause cancer in one specific organ because that organ is where the infection occurs. There are known cancer-specific infections that target the liver, the stomach, and the cervix. I wondered whether these infections make BRCA-related cancers specific for these organs. Here you see data showing the risk for these infection-related cancers in people who have inherited mutations in processes involving BRCA1 and BRCA2. The results show that a mutation affecting these processes increases risks for cancers caused by organ-specific infections. These infections are then taking advantage of BRCA deficits and increasing cancer risks in infected organs. How does this work? Liver cells have receptors for hepatitis viruses. So cancer associated with hepatitis viruses becomes specific for the liver. Hepatitis causes cells from the immune system to infiltrate the liver. This leads to chronic inflammation if the infection isn't cleared. Cell death and replacement then can go on for years in an environment that permits gene mutations. Eventually, liver cancer develops. Other infections target other organs for cancer. Here you see a depiction of bacteria targeting the stomach for cancer. If this infection isn't cleared, chronic inflammation develops, the environment becomes mutagenic, and there is chronic cell death and replacement under these conditions. Similarly, human papillomaviruses target the cervix for cancer. Remember that the effects of cancer-associated infections are worse in carriers of BRCA gene mutations. No infection has been proven to cause ovarian cancer, but infection and inflammation do seem to increase ovarian cancer risks. A convincing piece of evidence for this is that tubal ligation prevents hereditary ovarian cancer. An explanation for why this occurs is that infection or inflammation cannot get past the blocked fallopian tubes to reach the ovaries. Carcinogens are another way to target specific organs for cancer. They can target organs along the route of exposure or elimination. Mutations in BRCA-related genes cause some carcinogens to become opportunistic and more likely to cause cancer. Besides infections associated with cancer, carcinogens like formaldehyde and acetaldehyde take advantage of inherited BRCA gene deficiencies. At least four different types of genetic mutations found in cancers associated with BRCA pathway deficits are the same types of DNA mutations caused by formaldehyde and acetaldehyde. Excessive alcohol consumption shows how this works. 
Carcinogens from alcohol can overwhelm the body's normal detoxification systems and then cause cancer in exposed organs. Acetaldehyde is a major carcinogen from alcohol. You know when you have overindulged in alcohol because acetaldehyde causes some of the worst hangover symptoms. Fortunately, there are enzymes that can detoxify acetaldehyde. But cigarette smoking and thousands of foods can also contribute to acetaldehyde so that the levels become cumulative. Many of these foods involve a fermentation step. Some yogurts, fermented vegetables, soy sauces, vinegar, and even some coffees can appreciably add to acetaldehyde levels. All this can give acetaldehyde detoxification enzymes a lot to do. But if these processes don't work fast enough, or if there's just too much, then acetaldehyde can go on to damage DNA and chromosomes. For example, it can cross-link chromosomal DNA and proteins, and these cross-links increase cancer risks. Repairing this kind of DNA damage often requires healthy BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene products. But if you have inherited mutations in these genes, acetaldehyde becomes much more dangerous and turns into an opportunistic carcinogen. DNA repairs become abnormal, more gene mutations occur, and cancer becomes more likely. You can see abnormal repairs on chromosomes from cells that are homozygous for a BRCA2 mutation. Here, you see cross-linked and damaged chromosomes that are not repaired, that are broken, and that are repaired incorrectly. Without a proper BRCA2 gene, DNA and chromosome repairs fail, or the wrong pieces of broken chromosomes are rejoined. This can lead to dangerous gene rearrangements that predispose to cancer. We already know how to avoid exposure to cancer-related infections, to formaldehyde, and to acetaldehyde. However, there are other environmental or dietary exposures that might also become opportunistic carcinogens. There are probably ways to manage these exposures as well, once the dangers have been clearly identified. The message is that it is probably possible to compensate at least partly for gene mutations associated with some hereditary cancers. We should be able to delay or to prevent some of them. There is much more we can learn and much more to do.